everybody, so in previous videos, about four or five of them, we made this thing which is our dual rotor turbine and of course it worked absolutely beautifully and as in line with modern research, I found some great research papers where various universities have been investigating this and there are some prototypes being put up because it just gives such a better result. Anyway, we put that together and we did it over a whole series of videos. This video is an omnibus of all of those videos, plus some extra information from the comments that I've been reading where I've missed some stuff out and people have been saying, well, how do you do that bit? How do you do that bit? So just to warn you, it's an omnibus of stuff you've seen before, but new information, and it's all about making this start to finish. So a friend of mine, Ben Berger, sent me a really interesting video and it seemed to show an easy way to get a massive improvement out of wind turbines. He looked for it again, but it had been taken down and the big mystery is why? Where's it gone? What happened? Now, I can't show you the whole video because of copyright restrictions. I didn't make the video, I don't own the copyright, so I can't show you the entirety of the video. But I can invoke fair use for educational purposes and show you about 10 seconds or so. But that should be more than enough for us to get the idea of what's going on. So have a look at the clip that I can show you. In this one you can see the difference in performance as they sit side by side in the same wind. And here we can see the general arrangement of what it is we're going to be looking at. Remember this from video 2012, our awesome portable wind yeah. turbine that gave an astounding result. Now there are a number of reasons for that great result and one of them without a doubt was this. It's the blade design. Now this blade design I did post on Thingiverse and the link is in video 2012, the description. And when you print it, you actually print it that way up. And this is the blade design we're going to use to attempt our replication of the mystery wind turbine and see if it does what it says on the tin. But when you print it that way, of course, the layers are all going like this in this direction, giving this a bit of a grain. So something unfortunate happens. If I give that a bend, <laughs> there you go, it doesn't last because it is extremely br um, brittle in the direction of the grain, which is most unfortunate. But if you then coat that with a load of this stuff, which is just super glue, and this one's a Volden super glue, but any super glue will do that. If you get to a coating with super glue, something really quite awesome happens. You can do this. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Coating them really is a piece of cake. This super glue comes in a whole range of thicknesses. You can get it quite jelly like. That's not much use. This is called precision super glue. It's the thin and watery stuff that you want because it's so thin. Now I'm using nitrile gloves. And this super glue, the amount of time that we're going to use them, won't get through the nitrile glove, so this is perfectly okay to do. Honestly, it stinks to high heaven, so if you want to do this and you're better off in a well ventilated area or outside, or you are going to cry because it will get into your eyes. All you do is take some of your thin stuff, put it onto there, and it'll just want to run, and take your finger and smear it on. Now it takes about half an hour or an hour to dry and that gives it time to soak into those lines. There we go. That's it. We just leave that. It'll soak into the lines. It'll dry. It'll harden and we'll get that effect. And of course, because we've got these gloves on, all we have to do is take them off inside out like that. <laughs> and hey presto, you're nice and clean. So you hold the glove, take that, fold it over your hands and you've packed your gloves away. You can just throw them away. Leave that to dry, and that's how you do it. It really strengthens it up, so you don't have to worry about the blade snapping. Of course, I printed six of these. They've all been coated with super glue, so they're all nice and tough. And we're going to put three in arrangement and then three on top. And to put them in arrangement, I've printed the base. It's got this cog design because we're going to fit it onto our motor. You can change that if you like. What we do with it is one goes up that way and the blade goes in like that. So you pop the blade into there. And you'll notice that the tip of the blade, that bit there, gets pressed against the surface, meaning that bit is the leading edge. We go around and do all three in that direction. Then the other one we do in the opposite direction. So we put it that way around and arrange the blade like that. So when we've built three of, uh, one of them, it looks like that. And that 
will go in that direction onto the cog and the wind will hit it here. We want one in the reverse direction, which will be this one here. That one there will go on there like that and we'll arrange that so that they're 60 degrees off. When we've let those harden, we stick this nose cone on. Actually, I've remodeled the nose cone to look like this. So now all you do is stick the blades in there and skip the nose cone step. The next bit you're going to want to be doing is getting some power out of it. And of course, to get power out of it, what you really need is a generator. A generator is essentially a motor in reverse. And what we've got here is a standard DC motor. And for a very long time, what you really did was bolt your blades onto there, cross your fingers, hope it's spinned, and it would give some output. This kind of motor is called a radial flux motor, and it's called a radial flux because the magnetic flux follows the radius. But of course, there is another way of looking at these, and that is following the axle. And of course, there is another style of generator called the axial flux because it follows the axle. And it is essentially two discs. Now, I've drawn this up in Tinkercad, but of course you could just cut these discs out of a lump of plastic with a hole saw and drill some holes in it. But I've done this in Tinkercad and I've put the uh, files on Thingiverse if anybody wants them. And you'll notice there's a big cog in the centre and we'll come to that in a minute. The basic though is the disc and on this one there are 18 magnet sets. So there's 18 of these little holes and they're going north, south, north, south, north, south. In there is 15 centimetre by 1 centimetre and 32 near dip magnets and there's a partner to it which is identical and if I put those two like that then the magnetic flux follows the axle and we get an axial flux so we get straightforward magnetic flux lines going between the two if we were to put a copper coil in between those and spin them then of course it's going to generate now I have a, a thing about serpentine coils so I've made a serpentine coil when you're thinking about coils, you're really thinking about Fleming's right hand generator rule where the movement, current and field of magnets are set at 390 degrees from each other. So when you have movement in one direction and you have a field crossing other, the direction of the current is always going to be given for you and fixed. Of course, in a generator, the movement's the same way, but the field is going north-south, north-south, so the field is exchanging. So what we effectively want to do is have the current move one way and then the other way. We want to join that up somehow so that the net effect is the current moves only one way. Now we can do that really simply. Actually, we just do that like this. You'll notice that the wire goes up one side and down the other side, and so the current moves in the right direction. And a serpentine coil represents that. With this coil, I've got this massive coil of hair-thin wire, a bit of a wooden board, and two bolts with some rubber over them. And what we do is put the bolts in the board and just wind the coil round and round, and then tape it all together. It'll make more sense when you see it, so let's get on with that. And there's our coil wound. Now all we've got to do is jam it on this former. Incidentally, if you want three fares, make three of these. And then we just wind that onto the former in a serpentine. And when you've done that, that is what you get. Now on a practical point, you might notice on the coil, I put these little tape bits here to hold the coil together. And in that position, because it makes it a piece of cake to then put the coil onto the actual former. So this serpentine coil, would go between these two discs when we spin them it's going to generate and that is the basics of an axial flux generator. The first axial flux generator was a Faraday disc which just used a disc of copper in an axial flux arrangement of magnets. Now axial flux generators use less parts, there's only actually three, there'll be four because there's a, a plate to go on it, but it uses less parts, it's much lighter, it's much easier to make and much more tolerant 
of error. So the tolerances aren't nearly as tight. Of course, the closer you get them, the better, but they're nowhere near as tight. They have their disadvantages in motors in that they are heat dissipation can be an issue, but these have become extremely popular with the growth of electric vehicles because they're much higher torque dense, they're much lighter, so they're much more power dense than a traditional motor. But they make great generators and we're going to make an axial flux generator. What we're going to do with this is just put the cap on there and then put one of these discs on here, the other disc on the other side. And that's our generator made. And there it is put together. Now the only thing I've done is stuff an M8 bolt down the centre. There is an M8 washer between the magnet disc and the coil disc to stop the plastic bits rubbing. And then the other side is connected there with a nut to hold the whole thing together. So that's all there is to it. I've stuck a handle on it here, which is just a, a broom handle adapter. Again, that's in the files, just so I can hold on to it. But that's finished. If I give that a spin by hand, I've got a meter here. We'll get some kind of reading out of it. There we go. So it's really that simple to make something like this. Now I mentioned these cogs. These cogs are because I like to make things in a modular kind of way so that we can do different things with them and obviously that cog fits this which is the earlier wind turbine version that we made and if we just slot that on we have ourselves a wind turbine. Now what we're going to do is test the blades and remember they have to go in that orientation with an offset of 60 degrees to each blade. So we just shove them on and we can hold that from the wind. The blade has a crease in it and that's the wind direction. It should come from that side. If it comes from that side, it will actually work, just not as well as it works if it comes from that side. So on this quick test, all we're really going to do is stick this on a broom handle, exhibit A, and hold it up in the air and see what happens. Obviously, what we could really do with is a swivel joint down here and a tail so that it would actually self-direct it uh, and that's easy enough to do but I'm quite excited by this and I want to see what it does. We are clearly up on the hill and because we're up on the hill we've got no meters so we are going to use this to give us an idea then we'll see if it's working then we'll go back to the lab. Anyway let's get this up in the air. Okay, I feel a bit like a medieval wizard, really, with a wizard staff. But we're going to stick this up in the air, and we're hopefully we'll get it to spin. Now, I'm going to put this on it. Remember, the turn-on voltage for this is about 25 volts, and it draws about 100, 120 milliamps. Depending on how bright it gets, it's going to give us an idea of how much we're generating. Of course, we really need to take measurements, but I can't tell you how annoying it is when you do that, and people go... It doesn't work in the real world. So I like to bring it out in the real world and then we'll take measurements after. So let's get it up in the air and see what happens. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's lighting. Wow. You can, that, that is wow. Look at that, that's lighting beautifully actually. Whoa. <laughs> Man, that's really cool. Wow. Isn't that lovely? That's beautiful. It is actually, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm holding a strimmer. <laughs> One of these blades come off, it's going to cut me in two. <laughs> It'll be a nasty accident. Luckily, we strengthened all of these up because that is some speed. Okay, let's take a wind reading. Okay, the wind really isn't that strong. It's going between sort of 3.3 meters per second and 2.5 meters per second. Yeah, it got to 3.4. And you might have noticed halfway through that video, that looked like it stood still. And that's because the speed that that was turning was more or less equal to the speed at which it was being filmed. Now I looked up the frame rate, it's uh, 25 frames per second, meaning that was turning at about 1500 RPM and it was turning 1500 RPM in about a three or four meter per second wind. That's incredible. Now, 
Normally, with a rotor like this, then you're limited by the bet's limit. There's nothing you can do about it, it's just the physics of everything. And everybody is searching for a way to beat the bet's limit because you can improve the efficiency of a wind turbine. You'll never do it with just a rotor like that. But you can do it. You can do it if you do things like use a duct, because a duct collects a greater area of uh, a greater area of wind and so you are effectively using a larger blade if you like and so it looks like you're beating it. Another way of beating it is with something like this, a dual rotor. These dual rotors are so efficient that they're in fact the hot topic in wind research at the moment. If you put in dual rotor wind turbine into a Google search you'll find a lot of information about this particular kind of wind turbine and how good it really is and we saw that. We saw that when we were able to light up that LED and I didn't measure it, it was about 30 volts and it was about 100 milliamps, which is incredible when you think about the wind speed and how tiny this little wind turbine actually is. So if you're looking for a wind turbine, then I can suggest a dual rotor would be a way to go. Now this thing is a little lethal. I mean, you know, it's spinning blades, basically. What I'm interested in is having it that way up. Having it that way up in a Darwin wind collector, I think would be an awesome um, solution, really. And this is a nice compact design for doing something like that, but it has very good performance. Now I've also replaced the foot here. You might notice that's a bit sturdier. That's because the I broke the foot putting it on the broom handle. So I've redesigned the foot and I've updated the uh, Thingiverse file for it with the new foot in there. But that, I'm really quite pleased. It was an exceptional result. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. And please do remember to like and subscribe.